Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship. Uh, just sharing with you a passage from John, 1 John, sorry, 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. This is a message we have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Let's pray. Loving God, it is your love that has brought us here to worship with you. It is your love that has made us accept ourselves and who we are. It's your love that's enabled us to love our fellow person. And so, Lord, as we gather, we gather under the call of love. We gather under the command of love. And we gather under the rece receiving of love. May this time be a time where we as a church work together with one purpose, one love, one Saviour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask um, Ben, who would come and bring the reading to us. Good morning and great Wednesday to you all. It's uh, another beautiful day in the Lord. And um, today I will be sharing with you Matthew 22, 34 to 40. And it's about the greatest commandment. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. That's great. So, um, yeah, it's a, we'll get Russell up to share his message again. And, um, yeah, come with open ears. This is awesome. Thank you, Russell. Thanks, Ben, for that message. And, and today we focus on a very familiar passage and it encompasses the command of Jesus to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength and to love our neighbours ourselves. I was a fairly um, precocious kid, I suppose, at school and uh, I often was a bit of a, a rebel. And I loved it when all of a sudden in a brand new school year you would get a set of school rules <laughs> with little instructions like don't run under the don't run under the school or don't run on the concrete or do this, do that. And quite often they were very specific rules. And as an eight or nine year old, I used to love going through them and say, well, they don't say anything about smoking. <laughs> they don't say anything about punching people. And I would always find some loophole where, um, whereby I could say, well, it's not in the school rules. You know, I was never going to carry that out to see whether that would work or not but often I was very cynical and I found loopholes in all of the rules that were brought out. Until, until we got a new principal who came and he's, he, he's put out the school rules and he put out the school rules. The school rule was to respect each other. Oh, huh. that's a very simple thing, isn't it? But the more you thought about it, the more I found that I had no loopholes to be able to bend the rules to my advantage. And sometimes we get complex things and we can encapsulate them in just one or two words. Respect is one. And in this reading that we read today, we find an expert in the law comes to Jesus and says, what is the greatest command? Because like my school rules, they had a swag of commands. And if you look through Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, and, and you'll find numerous rules and regulations that were given to the Jewish people on a, a, an incredible range of topics. Topics like mildew, topics like skin diseases, sexual relations, acceptable sacrifices, unacceptable sacrifices, what sort of feasts you could do, what you could eat, what you could wear, how you tithe, the command to tithe. And so it went on and on with great, a great many rules and regulations. And of course to clarify things, all of a sudden the, the Pharisees found that they had to add more to clarify what these things meant. For example, you were not allowed to work on the Sabbath. And they sort of said, well, what's work mean? 
what's work mean? Is breathing work? Is lifting something a fork to eat work? So they had to work out what work defined work, what they could and could do. And so they had this plethora of regulations. In Melbourne, there is a little part of Melbourne, uh, and on, you know when you come to the traffic lights and you press the, the button to, go, to walk across, well, these were ones that worked automatically. You didn't have to press them. And the reason they'd worked automatically was that this was near a synagogue. And this particular group of Jews, when they walked to church or to um, the synagogue on a Saturday, they would not press the button because that was work. <laughs> and so they had to install these automatic uh, things because they refused to press them on the Sabbath because that was work. So when these people who were entrenched in, in all these codes and, and regulations and rules came to Jesus, I wonder what they expected from him. And Jesus quotes from the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, You will love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. And then he adds an extra in case they didn't get it. Leviticus 19, 18, You will love the Lord, your, you will love your neighbour as yourself. Simple, compact, and yet it's pithy. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. And I thought about that, and I have to make a confession that I don't love the Lord my God always with heart and soul and mind. In fact, there are some times when I find myself doubting my faith and thinking, is this God stuff real? <laughs> is what I've been living a lie? Will I get to the end of my life and find that all the things that God promises don't happen, that God doesn't exist? I don't know that you've ever had doubts like that, but I have, they've come into my mind. And so I found myself thinking, how can we as tangible people love an intangible and infinite God? A God we can't see. And of course, our, our opponents often mock us and say, well, you know, how can you believe in this God in the sky? You can't see him, you can't hear him. How do you know he's even there? And I found myself going to those three words, heart, soul and mind. How do I love my God with my heart, my soul and mind? And I thought about God as an intangible. But an intangible is a permanent. Have a think about that. The intangibles are the permanent things. The intangibles are the real things. And when he says to love God with all our heart and soul and mind, he's talking in intangibles. I can't, when we talk, I have a heart, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about something that encourages us to love someone else. And that's not only intangible, it's infinite. If I have... Right, we had planned to have four children and we had a fifth one come along. <laughs> I can't sit down to number five and say, I'm sorry, we gave all the love to the first four because love is infinite. Your soul. Your soul is not something that you can pull out of your body and say, here it is. Your mind. Your mind you might have a brain, but your mind you can't see. You can't measure. And people today, I think many people say, if you can't see it, there's no evidence for its existence. existence. And so I have to say, while I've had my times of doubt, I've had more times where I just know that I know that I know. So let's look at that heart, soul and mind. And I found myself thinking, well, what does the heart mean? And I came up with... Different, slightly different names and you can argue whether I'm right or wrong here but if we talk about the heart we talk about intuition intuition there is something within us that knows that there's something out there it intrigues me even people who don't have a faith are often amazed by what's out there You have a look at all of the um, cultures during the history of humankind and all of them have had a belief in something that is beyond themselves. 
And even atheists who say there isn't a God, they're all saying, well, there must be life on other planets. It's almost like we're reaching beyond ourselves because we know deep in our hearts that there's more to life than us. In fact, it's interesting, and I read this in um, New Scientist magazine, that it says children are born believers. We are born believers. They have a strong natural tenderness towards religion. When it comes to speculations about the origins of natural things, children are very receptive to explanations that invoke design or purpose. Margaret Evans of the University of Michigan in, um, in Ann Arbor has found that children under 10 tend to embrace creationist explanations of living things over evolutionary ones, even children whose parents and teachers endorse evolution. Kuhlman has also done experiments with adults and suggests we do not outgrow that attraction. But this is where the crunch line comes. It must be forcibly tamped down through formal education. I find that amazing. They put that in print. What they're saying is there is a natural thing, and they've done studies with uh, atheist children and also all of them have some form of belief that goes into adulthood, and yet they don't acknowledge that. We need to get rid of this through formal education. Let's educate it out of them. I find that truly amazing. And I think that's one of the reasons sometimes that people are so angry about faith because they're denying what really deep down in the hearts they know is true. So there's intuition, there's our heart. Our heart knows that God exists. And I find it interesting that people who, who deny that will often say, you know, when a calamity comes, I'll say, the first thing I did was pray. I prayed to God. <laughs> and I say, God, you know, get me out of this. So there's the intuition, there's the heart. We love God with our heart. And the more we love with our heart, the more we follow our intuition, the more we find we fall in love with God. The second one is logic. Love God with all your heart and mind. Mind. In Romans 1, chapter 19 to 20, Paul says this, you know, the, there is no excuse for anyone because the invisible qualities of God are seen through his creation. We see the invisible qualities through his creation. Some time ago, I came across a butterfly collector and he had a wonderful array of pin butterflies. And I said to him, I, I pointed one out and I said, that's a bird wing, isn't it? He said, no, it's not. It's not a bird wing. But he said, that's a clever butterfly because it's a different species, but it's worked out that the bird wing has a bad taste. So birds will not approach the bird wing. And so it's made itself look like a bird wing, so birds will not attack it. And I thought, this man has a doctorate, and he's telling me this butterfly is clever enough to not only know what another butterfly tastes like, but to start to look like that butterfly. And you know what that told me? This butterfly isn't clever. We have a creator who is clever. It's interesting, the number of people who have found God through logic, through deduction. Um, there was a gentleman, I read a book once called Thank God for Atheists. And this gentleman was a pastor in a church and he found himself being weary and questioning his faith. And in the end he said, I don't believe in God anymore. And so he started to read some of the popular atheists of the, of the, around now, Dawkins and uh, Hitchens and those people. And he said their arguments were so terrible <laughs> that I found myself coming back to Christ because he's satisfied. David Watson, great preacher in, in, in England in the last century, he said there is one question that is vital amongst anything else. Is God real? If he, is, if he isn't, well, fine. We discover that. But if he is, then my obligation is to find him. So he went through this process and he came to the point of bending down on his knees and saying, thank God. C.S. Lewis said he was the most reluctant Christian in, in all of Christendom because he went through and he found and he realised that there was no other explanation. It's interesting that in the Christian faith there are two claims that really seem ridiculous. The claim that Jesus rose from the dead and the claim that Jesus was God. And while they seem ridiculous, the more you believe, the more real those two claims are. 
And in the whole of 2,000 years since the resurrection, no one has discredited, been able to discredit those claims. We get revelation through the scriptures too, the logic of the scriptures. Somebody once tackled Ravi Zacharias and said, how do you know the Bible's true? How do you know, for example, the Quran isn't true? And Ravi Zacharias said, you can go to any university in the world and you can do a study on trying to do a critical analysis of the Bible. And he said, in spite of people doing that, it still comes up as credible. He said, you can't do that with the Quran. As soon as you start to question it, you find that people will react in an angry way. Isn't it amazing that sometimes when we react that way, we have something to hide or we're frightened of something being found out? John Lennox says that about evolution. He said, when, as soon as anybody challenges evolution, the shutters go up as if, you know, um, we don't want to talk about that. He said, you can talk about, you can do a critical analysis of Einstein's theory, but you can't touch that. And the third one is revelation, or if you like, I call it the soul. Paul is on the Damascus Road and he experiences this incredible revelation of Christ. And some of us have not experienced that in such a dramatic way. But all of us have had experiences of the revelation of God in our own life. It's interesting, there was a woman who became a Christian and none of her family were Christians and quite often they would make fun of her and one morning at breakfast her teenage son said, Mum, in the Bible it says this and this and this and he questioned some of the things and she turned around and said, I'm not going to answer you. I'm going to give you one question. Have I changed? Have I changed? And you know, the husband listened to that and he thought, this woman is a very different woman to the one before she became a Christian. And those three words led him to, to realise the difference that Christ had made in her life. And the result of that was the whole family eventually became Christian. As we seek to know God, he gives a revelation, it's incredible, he gives a revelation of himself. And that encourages us to search a little bit more. And then the more we search, a little bit more of God is revealed. You find that, that as you search, the more you search, the more you, you are revealed. And that's what faith is. It's a, a continual revelation of more and more of God. If you don't search, God closes off. He's a gentleman. But if you do. So as a follower, we use our mind, heart, soul, and we become deeper absorbed into the love of God. I haven't mentioned the second commandment, but let's have a look at it very briefly. It's really interesting, isn't it, that um, if you thought about it, the second one may not even be necessary because it, it's a, a flow on from the first. We are to, it's two, it has two parts to it. We are to love God as we love ourselves. We can't love someone else unless we are secure in who we are. And loving ourselves doesn't mean an arrogance or a pride. What Jesus is saying is acknowledging that we are Christ's children. That we are Christ's children. And so when we are comfortable in who we are, that enables us to love other people. But there's a reverse to that. As we love others, well, as I love others, I find that I'm drawn deeper and deeper into God's love. It's interesting, isn't it, that if we love, if we find ourselves loving the intangible God, we love the tangibleness of his creation. And in loving the tangibleness of his creation in people, we find ourselves being drawn closer to God. And we, we meet people and go, wow, wow, we hear their stories. Wow, how God has worked in their life. Mary Poplin worked, she was a professor in education and she had a sabbatical, so she decided to work with um, Mother Teresa. And one of the things she kept puzzling over was Mother Teresa said we're not a social justice organisation, we are a Christian organisation and she thought what is the difference? They do social justice anyway, why does she not consider that to be her role? And, um, and they were deeply involved in prayer and, and spending time with God and one day Mother Teresa said to her, 
if we were a social justice organisation only, we would have burnt out years ago. But we are a Christian organisation because we see the face of Jesus in every person we speak to. And I want to finally say one thing. It is impossible to keep those two commandments. We can't love God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. It's impossible. So what is God saying? What is Jesus saying? Love is the thing that directs our action and we can never, ever love enough. It is infinite. It's intangible. And it's permanent. Let's pray. Loving God, these are such simple, simple stories and simple that we've heard over and over again and yet there is so much of depth to them. And so we just pray that you would draw us deeper into you in the name of Jesus. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen.